Hi, and welcome back to Leslie's Lab. I recently acquired a couple of MNL100 nitrogen lasers off of eBay. Uh, these things are bolt anchors, they're scrap, right? So I figured, well, why not do an in-depth teardown on one and see if we can actually coax some life out of it. So let's stick this on the bench and take a look. I picked up two more MNL100 nitrogen lasers off of eBay. These were particularly cheap, they were being sold as spares or repairs. Um, they're apparently system poles from a working environment, but we all know when we see those kind of listings that these are poles out of a dumpster, right? Uh, so there's a huge ding on the side of the thing. Uh, neither of these things worked, so I thought they'd make uh, a, an ideal teardown. You know, we're going to tear it right down, right down to the guts um, and take a good look at it. Um, I'm fairly convinced that these can be resurrected, um, so possibly in a future video we'll do that as well. Uh, but let's whip the case off of this thing and take a look. So in a previous teardown video, we take a look at one of these, but I didn't delve too deeply into it because, well, it was a working nitrogen laser, right? Uh, but this one, you know, we can strip it right down to the guts and see what's inside. So we've got a large piece of uh, capped on over the top of the high voltage assembly. Um, this is to prevent the capacitors from arcing to the case. Um, so we can see our two high voltage doorknob caps. Um, yeah, awesome. Let's, let's swing this around and start from the microcontroller right the way, you know, front to back. So. There's our microcontroller. Now in this particular, uh, well in both of the nitrogen lasers that I picked up, the microcontrollers are what has failed. Um, these are working in very sort of electrically noisy environments um, and I suspect, you know, it's probably quite common that boards fail before everything else fails in these things, but, uh, but yeah, so it is what it is. Let's unplug all of the little plugs and we'll see if we can get this PCB out. So yeah, this is all um, surface mount stuff. We've got a little PIG microcontroller. Um, this is a motor controller because some of the versions, and there are plenty of versions of these as well, uh, some of the versions have a, a, like a rotating attenuator. Um, we've got some little um, simplex uh, fiber optic connectors on the side. This, the top two are for the serial and the bottom is for uh, the trigger. Um, there's an external electronic trigger in. And then there's what looks like a, a USB socket. In fact, it is a USB socket. It's one of the old style mini USBs. Um, this is actually an interlock. And what you do is you short two pins together um, and then you can turn on the laser. But like I say, this one, unfortunately, the magic smoke uh, started wisping out from down at the bottom here. And you know, it's, it's a fairly dead board. On the reverse, we've got two very interesting things. Um, I don't know whether these are photodiodes or LEDs, um, but these couple into uh, fiber optics coming from the, the guts of the nitrogen laser there. Got a little interlock switch on the back. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Uh, there's TVS diodes all the way up, you know, some of these surface, uh, surface mount components are a real pain in the ass to get the, you know, to make sense of the numbers because, you know, different manufacturers do different stuff. Uh, but a few of them are most assuredly TVS diodes. Um, and you know, like I say, it's sort of electrically exceedingly noisy in these things. Um, and so when, when the nitrogen laser fires, it generates a huge electromagnetic pulse, which can find its way back into the microcontroller. Um, and sort of damage things. So yeah, um, there's plenty of opto isolators down at the bottom. So everything that's uh, everything that's been controlled in the case uh, before it's popped out as wires goes through an opto isolator first as well uh, to try and protect the electronics. Um, I think when I come to resurrect these things. Um, I, I, I'm fairly confident we can make our own control board. Um, we don't have to go as far as microcontrollers. I'm pretty sure we can do it with like, you know, simple electronics, some simple logic um, and do something interesting with it. Um, these bits and pieces, incidentally, you know, if the microcontrollers failed, chances are the high voltage power supply is good and chances are that the pre-ionizer board's good. Um, so, you know, maybe we can take a look at those. So I'll just try and disconnect the ground lead from the power supply. That's us. So we've got our high voltage positive there and then we've got the, the ground from the high voltage PSU and there's plenty of bolts holding this on. There's a couple on the bottom and then there's some in the back of the case. We'll take a look at the pre-ionizer board separately so I'll ignore it for now. I just need to disconnect everything. So we're getting there. 
Um, let's get in there and disconnect the fiber optic couplings. It's very, very tight, has to be said. Oh, that's too small. So I've disconnected the pre-ionizer board and we can see there's a fiber optic coming from it um, out into the microcontroller there. Uh, so that answers one of the questions as to where the fiber optics come from. Let's see if we can get that. We'll take a look at this separately. Um, we've got another fiber optic connector down at the bottom um, and this is from a metal block on the chassis which I suspect is probably the energy meter but yeah, um, yeah another fiber optic connection. So we should be able to relieve the high voltage power supply of its little prison. I'll just set that off to one side. So that's it. There's our high voltage power supply. Um, it looks like most of the stuff is potted inside of a, um, a large block uh, of resin. There's our high voltage cable. Uh, we've got a little control circuit down at the bottom. Um, yeah, we should be able to, I think we can probably hack that to produce um, 12 and a half thousand volts, no problem. Uh, there's a lot of surface mount stuff on the back, so I suppose with this, uh, the way to sort of attack this is to probe around and see if we can uh, see if we can cause it to um, generate some high voltage output. But uh, yeah, cool. So that's that part. We'll take a look at this board. Uh, this has conveniently got markings on it. So this is this is the control. This is uh, sort of part of a driver board and a control board that drives a bunch of stuff. Um, so right at the very top, you might be able to see it on camera. We'll try and get it up real close. Um, we've got one is labeled, so one of these, uh, one of these packages is labeled pre-ionization and the other one's labeled high voltage switch. Um, we can see down at the bottom, it actually tells us that the bottom two pins here are 24 volt supply and then the top two are HVOK, uh, which is high voltage OK, right? Um, so yeah, um, if we flip it over, uh, we've got a little high voltage power supply on the right hand side. Um, this generates about 800 volts and somewhere on the PCB it says exactly that. There's a little, um, a little bit of PCB there that says uh, 800 volts OK and a little LED next to it. Um, so this is why I'm fairly confident that we can actually power this stuff up, right? Because if we can get that powered up, and we can get the pre-ionizer board working, um, we, should, we should be all good. We should be able to, we could maybe dispose of the solid state switch and replace it with a spark gap, for example, right? Um, but yeah, so if we flip this thing over, we've got our 800 volt supply on the right hand side. Um, this is switching something, um, something to do with the semiconductor switch down at the bottom there. Um, but the other one, check out this guys, look at the size of the surface mount capacitor on here. Um, this is absolutely enormous. So this switching transistor here, or this assembly here, rather the capacitor and the transistor, they're charged up to 800 volts DC. Um, and then this is discharged into this, um, which looks like a very big toroid. Um, it is in fact a 10 to 1 transformer. So if we've got 800 volts coming in, we'll get 8 kilovolts um, peak at these two prongs here on the board. Um, and this is what pre-ionizes the laser. Um, when we get into it, when we take a look at the laser tube itself, we'll see that uh, it's sort of quite an unusual design. Um, and so we have to pre-ionize the laser tube internally before we provide it with a high voltage pulse to drive it. Um, so yeah, pretty interesting. So yeah, we'll, we'll maybe take a look at, you know, later on we'll maybe take a look at powering up this and powering up the high voltage supply and seeing what we can do um, with this nitrogen laser. So yeah, in a, in a previous video we took a look at this um, this high voltage switch. We never we never disassembled it. I might do. Um, in this one, we'd have to pick out all of the all of the silicone rubber. So you know maybe after this tear down, I'll go away and pick all this out and uh, and really tear it down and have a look. Uh, but yeah, so this is a solid state replacement for a spark gap. Um, this is bolted down into the bottom of the base plate as well. We'll just get that out. So yeah, everything's on. Oh, that's interesting. Everything's on a slab of ceramic. Um, so this is our ground connection down at the bottom. So we've got a high voltage feed coming in and the idea is that this assembly is gonna clamp the high voltage to ground, uh, causing the tube to fire. Um, yeah, it's actually, it actually looks like it's all on a piece of ceramic. Let me just tap it. Yeah, um, it looks like we've got a ceramic PCB. Interesting. Oh, actually, I think that might be easy, pretty easy to pick apart. Um, let's do it. 
I mean, the, the thing's probably useless anyway. Um, I've got one out of the other nitrogen laser that I'm going to keep as spare, so I suppose we can afford to destroy one and take a look. Let's, let's go for it. Why not? Whoops, I broke it anyway now. Right, we'll sacrifice it for, for you guys, right? Let's go for it. I wasn't going to bother. I was thinking, well, well, maybe I'll keep this, but I don't know. It's, it's getting the better of me. What, what semiconductors do they have inside this damn thing that allows it to switch, you know, 12,500 volts um, reasonably? This is actually pretty easy to pick off. Or are we going to see nothing? Oh, some surface mountry going on in there. I'm, I'm just sort of, I'm just sort of curious. Is it going to just be dyes that have been bonded to the, to the ceramic substrate? It looks suspiciously like it might be, right? It does actually look like this is a, this is a special component. Let's keep going. So there's our, definitely a gate dryer transformer, right? Must be. What else could it be? Um, I've cracked the ceramic, so it's now, uh, it's now absolutely borked. So I've just carried on picking away at this um, off of camera there. And yeah, these look like the, there are actually three connections to every single one. So it looks like they're probably um, like insulated gate bipolar transistors at a guess. Um, there's 13 devices altogether. Um, they look like they're in series uh, from one end all the way down to the other. Um, so I guess at 12 and a half thousand volts, these would see like, you know, 900, a thousand volts each or so. Um, very, very interesting. Um, I'm not entirely sure what this is. Um, I haven't looked up the part number, but my suspicion is uh, probably a thermistor, right? Because you probably want to mon monitor the temperature of these things. Um, there's an absolute rake of other surface mount components on here as well. You know, they're, they're probably um, like snubber, snubbers for the, the gate drive, um, all of these down here. I'm not entirely sure what the crack is here, whether these are plain diodes or not, but yeah, very, very interesting. Um, has to be said, never seen anything like that. What's on the reverse? Ooh, now, I did not expect that. There's more goodies on the backside, so let's keep picking. Um, looks like we've got some surface mount caps. It looks like we've got some printed, um, see the printed resistors or, or interconnects that they've painted over there. But yeah, we've got some very, very large surface mount capacitors there as well. Um, might be worth recovering these and sort of measuring them, see what they are. Um, if I'm right, then there's going to be a whole slew of these all the way along the top as well. Look at that. Obviously, the things fall into a bit in my hands now because I'm picking off all of the, all of the sealant. But yeah, very very interesting. Um, I think this is maybe something. You know, I'll maybe set this aside in a parts box and and maybe take a closer look at these things. See what everything is. You know, see if we could maybe duplicate it. Um, I think this would be very difficult to duplicate, right? Switching high voltage with semiconductors is a hard job. Um, it's, it's a hard design job for a start off, right? So I don't know what the chances are of succeeding at this um, at home. Um, but yeah, it's certainly very, very interesting anyway. So let's see what else we've got going on here. Um, at the rear, we have what looks like a sensor. Um, this has got a fiber optic output, um, which is pretty interesting. In fact, is it a sensor? Yeah, so we've got, we've got a little connector there that says EMON, um, which will be energy monitor. Um, so let's just disconnect that. So obviously they've got this thing talking to the to the logic board with a piece of fiber optic. Um, so we'll peel, we'll pop that off and see what we've actually got. Because um, that'd be useful, right? If we're, if we're harvesting components out of these things, energy monitors, pretty handy things to have. So there's our energy monitor. There's a really, really nice lens on the front of it. And Presumably we've got a sensor down the bottom as well. It's on a nice piece of machined aluminium. Excellent. Um, let's see if I can find a tool to get into there and we can, we can maybe pop the case. I don't want to be uh, too, too ham-fisted with this. You know, I do, I do want to get like uh, a working laser out of this in the end and I'm like say, I'm confident we can do that. Uh, but I am curious what's in there. So let's have a look. So let's pop the case off of the energy monitor and see what is in there. 
Um, yeah, I think I've mentioned before, there's all sorts of variations on these, right? So some have an inbuilt monit energy monitor, some don't. Some have an inbuilt attenuator, some don't. There's a 30 hertz version, a 60 hertz version, and a high energy version as well. Um, and they're all in the same case, so they've all got these sort of options, right? Um, which is pretty interesting. So there's our energy monitor. Um, nothing too exciting to see there. There's one of those components again. Um, looks like, well, if we're, you know, presuming we're transmitting data, it's going to be an LED, right? Um, so we've got this very, very sort of interesting LED that's got a, a divot sort of machined into it so that the fiber optic fits right in there just snug as you like. And that's pretty cool. So if we want to see the sensor itself, we'll better take these two off. Like I say, I'm going to be, be gentle with this thing. Um, I don't want to go too ham-fisted. Oh, it's finger tight, so that's good. We'll just pop the cap off real quick and take a look, see, and then I'll reassemble this thing because it's probably a component that will be worth saving, right? I'd be interested to see what it spits out of the LED then, sort of what data are we getting out of there. That just looks like a simple, looks like a simple photodiode to me. Very, very interesting. Cool. I wonder what they're doing there then. Now that is interesting. Um, this little thing, uh, so we've got a lens on the front there. It's actually got a filter behind it and the filter looks quite black. Um, my suspicion is that this just passes ultraviolet. Um, so we're just reading off the ultraviolet light by the, using the photodiode and then somehow outputting the data over this LED. Um, I'll maybe get the part numbers off these things and take a look and see what it is. Um, but yeah, for now, let's reassemble this thing and stick it somewhere safe because that's, like I say, it's definitely a component worth rescuing is that. So at the heart of every nitrogen laser is the tube. Uh, let's go and take a look at this. So I'm going to want to do uh, the front off of the case so that we can see what we're doing because we, again we don't want, to, don't want to fracture the tube. Been in here once before so these are all just finger tight. So the front panel here has, uh, all it has is a couple of fans mounted on it, that's it. There's nothing else um, exciting in there. So let's just remove it. So yeah, we've got a couple of uh, Sunon fans, uh, really nice sort of high quality fans. Uh, you know, the, the unit's air cooled. If we, it, nitrogen, when it warms up, doesn't tend to laze very, very well. So if we're keeping the, if we're keeping the thing nice and cool with a couple of fans, um, you can soon see how we get the repetition rate out of these things that the that these things are capable of producing. Um, so at the front, we've got a huge block of aluminium. Um, nothing exciting there. Let's get it off though. Um, well, I suppose at the top, we've got a little cowling that sits behind the fan so it doesn't blow dust into the window, right? It just blows the air over the tube. Um, but we'll get this off and then we can maybe look down the barrel of this tube. So let's just put it on one side. See if we can find a, a bit that fits. So once again, we'll have to be very careful here that we don't start going in at this too ham-fisted. We don't want to damage the tube. So there's our block of aluminium, just a piece of plain aluminium. Um, in a previous um, teardown where I did, you know, sort of a half a teardown on the MNL100, this had optional stuff mounted on it. So this would be where you bolted on the, um, the fiber optic coupler um, for the fiber coupled versions that you can get of these as well. Excellent, really nice piece of uh, machined aluminium. Um, what we're really interested in now is the tube. Um, so here's our tube. Uh, let's see if we can take a look down the bore. Don't know how well, ah, oh, there we are, perfect. So we can see right down the bore, and if you look at the very, very top and bottom, um, we can see our two main electrodes. Um, so that's, those are the two transverse electrodes that are responsible for lasing. Um, they're actually positioned quite far apart. I have a suspicion that perhaps um, this is atmospheric pressure or not far off as well. Um, but they do some interesting tricks to get it to fire. 
I don't know how well this will show up on camera, but there's two additional electrodes in there as well, which are the pre-ionizers. Excellent. Um, we've obviously got a mirror mount on the end there. We better not touch that. Don't want to damage things. Cool. Um, we've got a gas fill port um, that's sort of tucked away inside a bit of silicone tubing on the bottom. And this connection down here is coming from these two prongs that we pulled out of the pre-ionizer. Um, so they feed into this flex PCB and come up to the pre-ionizer electrode. So there's one here that runs the length of the tube to there. And then there's one over there that runs the length of the tube to there. Um, really, really sort of interesting arrangement. We've got, we've got our dumper capacitors down at, up at the top there. Um, and we're sort of, you know, if you've watched other nitrogen laser videos of mine, you'll be familiar with the sort of purpose of those. The peaking capacitor is actually mounted on flex PCB. Um, we've got an inductor here, um, which shorts the peaking capacitor to ground when it's not doing its peaking job, right? Um, but everything's on flex PCB. And if we look very, very closely down the edge of the flex there, we can see they've actually got surface mount capacitors on there. Let's, let's undo this and see if we can take a look at those. Okay, we've got a bit that fits. Where's the screwdriver? Now, I'll have to be very careful here because I most assuredly do not want to crack the ceramic because my suspicion is that although the control electronics are cactus, um, the rest of it is probably, you know, the tube is probably fine. Um, it definitely serviceable. Even if the tube was up to air, um, we could we could conceivably pump it down um, with a vacuum pump and refill this thing with nitrogen. Um, so we definitely want to preserve our tube. We'll go from the edge. At some point, this is going to suddenly fall over. Uh, so this is bolted on with a big lump of. Uh, brass at the top here and it's going to be heavy on one side we should be all right till we pull the last screw right oh, that's giving up its secrets right let's be real careful So I'm just going to open this this far, that uh, should be far enough. Let's take a look. So yeah, our peaking capacitor is actually surface mount caps. How about that? That is the most fascinating thing I've ever seen in a, in a nitrogen laser design. Absolutely fantastic. Um, this is our top electrode connection. So we've got a huge connection on the, on the ceramic case there. Absolutely fascinating. So yeah, we've got these two peaking capacitors this side and they both go to ground So they both go into the bottom electrode which is bolted to the case and then on the other side We've got the same the same job as well Excellent I'm gonna reassemble this just now I don't want this thing flapping around like that and um, because like I say we've, we want to you know The whole idea of this exercise is we should be able to power this thing back up I don't really want to touch the edges of here either get my grubby fingerprints on it um, I'm gonna button this back up just now and then we'll, we'll turn our attention to the power supplies and see if we can get those fired up. So I've got the uh, nitrogen laser reassembled, you know, the sort of tube portion of it, and I've also connected up the, uh, the pre-ionizer board. Um, so we can see our pre-ionizer connections here. Um, I've got everything hooked up to a power supply. Uh, we'll just hit the on button if I can reach it. Now this thing is clicking away to itself and if I upend we can see our little LED is lit uh, that says 800 volts okay. Um, we should be ionizing the tube. We'll see if we can get a view of that. And we should be able to see, uh, you should be able to see the purple glow of the pre-ionizer inside the tube there. So the tube is definitely not up to air and the pre-ionizer board is in fact working. Um, so bonus, you know, we've, we're already well on our way to sort of solving this a particular issue and maybe getting a working nitrogen laser out of this. Excellent. When we look through the end of the tube there, when the pre-ionizer was running, the discharge was actually running the entire length of the tube. Now to get an electric discharge to do that kind of thing, you've got to actually apply quite a, a fast pulse to it. So I, my suspicion is that um, the, the very large surface mount capacitor 
and the, uh, the switching transistor that we're looking at earlier on produces a very, very short pulse. Now we can't measure this directly with the oscilloscope because we already figured, well, if the transformer is 10 to 1 and we're feeding it 800 volts, then we've got 8 kilovolts coming out, um, so we can't really probe that. So I've hooked up a current probe here, um, so we'll switch on the power supply and we'll go and take a look at the scope and see what we're looking at. So I'm taking an indirect measurement here with the current probe and we can see that we've got a pulse whose full width half maximum is about uh, 300 nanoseconds or thereabouts. Um, so yeah, particularly fast pulse. Uh, so this is what we're, or this is what the tube is seeing um, across the pre-ionization rails in there. Um, as for repetition, I think it's about 30 hertz or thereabouts. Oops. Yeah, so the scope says 27.5 hertz, so 27.5 times per second we're, we're hitting it with a, a 200 nanosecond 8000 volt pulse to pre-ionize the tube. Um, this is actually pretty interesting because in nitrogen lasers we need uh, the pre-ionization pulse to occur just before the main pulse, uh, the, the sort of main pulse of our discharge. Um, so I assume that the control circuitry also does some sort of synchronization as well. So when you say to it, um, I want to pulse one time a second, it's going to it's going to move the pulse around or the main ignition pulse as it were um, to fit in with uh, one of these pre-ionization pulses. So that'll be an interesting problem to overcome um, if we're going to attempt to rebuild this thing. We'll turn our attention to the high voltage power supply now. This is um, yet another pain in the backside um, in this particular laser. In order to get the PCB to try and figure out how to power this thing up, um, you've got to destructively tear it down. Um, we've got, we'd have to break off the aluminium plate on the back, um, unscrew things. Um, yeah, everything's, everything's all sort of very, very tight and it's very, very difficult to get in here. Um, I've identified power and ground, but when we connect anything to it, nothing happens. Um, so it's expecting some kind of signal in through these two um, these two jacks down at the bottom here. Uh, one says I lock, so I suspect it was an interlock, so I tried shorting it out and seeing what it would do, but nothing happens. Uh, the other one's HVOK, um, which comes from the other PCB and looks like it should be maybe 24 volts, but once again, nothing seems to happen when, uh, when I do something there, so I'm not quite sure what I'm missing. Um, there are three leads uh, that, that come out as well, and I'm not entirely sure uh, what the yellow lead is doing because we'd have to get down on PCB and take a look. Um, fortunately, or unfortunately, I don't know, I haven't quite worked this out, when I was poking around, there's a voltage to frequency converter chip down here, uh, which is responsible for driving the oscillator by the look of things. And it just so happens um, that if you pull pin 5 low, um, suddenly the thing bursts into life. So just for now, um, I've temporarily soldered on a piece of wire wrap wire um, and just grounded it on a convenient ground that was nearby, and the power supply lives. So let's just hook this up. So there's our ground, there's positive, and I will just go and poke the power supply on. And we can hear the whine of the high voltage. And if I grab the lead there, there's our 12,500 volt power supply up and running. I suppose in a pinch, if this thing had eaten itself, um, it's not the end of the world because it would take like, you know, 15 minutes to rattle out something with a line output transformer and a ZVS driver to replace it. Um, in fact, I might even do exactly that. You know, I might, uh, if I'm, if I'm going to do a rebuild on this thing, meh, maybe we might, maybe we might start getting rid of this proprietary stuff and have stuff that we can repair forever. Um, which is kind of nice because, you know, it's, it, it kind of sucks. We've got no manuals for this, no schematics, um, and sort of, you know, there's a couple of chips we can see on the back there and we can maybe work out what they're doing, but then everything else that's under there is all going to be surface mount right as far as the eye can see, and it's going to become a pig um, to replace things in the future, you know. Um, but for now, I'll just leave it, right? I mean, it's a working power supply, so what's not to like? Let's um, reassemble all this and then think about how we might switch this nitrogen laser. So we've got everything buttoned back up now, we've got the high voltage power supply working, uh, we've got the pre-ionizer working. Uh, what we need to do now is to figure out a way of switching this. Um, originally, earlier on in the video, uh, we had this semiconductor switch. Um, I suppose we could maybe buy a bunch of um, insulated gate bipolar transistors and do something with them, uh, but we would need about 13 of them. My best guess is that voltage rating for each one of these is going to be 1200 uh, volts a pop, and so it will be very, very expensive. 
If you've watched my previous videos though, um, I've been building my own homemade spark gaps for homemade nitrogen lasers. Um, so here's a miniature nitrogen laser. Um, do like and do subscribe and check out my other videos. Um, yeah, this is a homemade miniature nitrogen laser with a six centimeter long channel. And I've got a pressurized spark gap on there um, of my own design. Um, which is, you know, pressurized spark gaps are, are pretty awesome. They're, they're very, very simple. They're very, very robust. Um, they'll last almost forever. You know, if you're prepared to tear them down every couple of months and give them a good clean, um, these things are pretty much indestructible. And for the longest time in nitrogen lasers, this was exactly what every single nitrogen laser used. Um, for this experiment, I'll just use an air pressure um, spark gap. So this is an air pressure version of my uh, compact spark gaps. Um, we'll just connect this up and see if we can at least get some output. If we can get some output, um, then maybe we can think about building a triggered gap um, and actually building a trigger circuit um, to do a decent job of actually driving the nitrogen laser properly. Um, but just to test whether or not everything's you know in a serviceable condition, I think this will do just fine. Um, I think at this stage of my life, it's about time I invested in a lathe um, so that I can actually start building you know real precision spark gaps rather than just sort of hammering stuff together out of plumbing fittings. Um, I think it'd be you know, I think I'll be able to do a really nice job and make a really, really compact spark gap. Um, but for now, we'll just give this one a try and see if we can get the output out of it. So I've got the spark gap connected. Um, I've connected it with a, a large flat piece of uh, aluminium uh, to the top rail there. And then I've got a brass strap uh, grounding uh, the opposite end of the spark gap. So we'll power it up and see what happens. Um, we'd better get ourselves a paper target, to see if we can see any UV. And we'll just come around here and switch on the power supply. Awesome. Absolutely fantastic. We better not run it too long at that. Um, I think we're running it, it sounds to me, to be about 50 or 60 hertz or so. Um, but we had a very, very nice, bright ultraviolet output. Um, in fact, let's see that again because it was awesome, right? Absolutely fantastic. Now obviously this setup's not ideal, I can't get it back in the case with this very, very large spark gap hanging off the side there. Um, and because of that, of course, it's gonna be spewing RF out into the room. So let's have a look at the view on the oscilloscope real quick and you'll see what I'm talking about. So I have the oscilloscope set up over here and if I turn on the power supply, we can see the noise that's being radiated out. Now the probe's not actually connected to anything, it's just hung on a nail on the back wall there. And we can see quite a significant um, signal being radiated out into the room. This is the spark gap firing uh, and essentially giving us a burst of RF, um, yeah, which is not very, very pleasant. I think we're reading um, about four volts, uh, well, about eight volts peak to peak, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty significant given that the probe is just hanging on the wall behind it. So obviously we can do better than this. I mean, this, this is horrible. It's radiating RF everywhere and it would be really nice if we can get the metal case back on it. In a previous episode, I tore down a very, very small LSI nitrogen laser and we've got a triggered spark gap in here. Um, so my thinking is we'll get this triggered spark gap out. Uh, we'll mount it somewhere in this case. Uh, we'll need to build a little trigger circuit for it. And I think there's enough room here um, to put in a, a, a small trigger PCB with a little trigger transformer on it. Um, there should be enough room in the back of the case to mount a high voltage power supply and some additional control electronics. And we'll see if we can get this thing to really, really perform. Um, my suspicion is it's gonna be fantastic. Um, so make sure you hit like and subscribe and wait for me in the next episode, folks, where I do exactly that. Thanks for watching this episode of Leslie's Lab. If you want to see more content like this, don't forget to hit like and subscribe down below and I'll see you guys next time.